Welcome to the Living Well Church podcast and thanks for tuning in today. Our mission as a church is to help people find faith in Jesus and a life of purpose and hope. You're about to watch a message that will challenge you, inspire you, encourage you and most of all point you to Jesus and the life of purpose and hope he has planned for you. So lean in and enjoy and let God speak into your life. It's really good to be with you this morning and uh, I think our, our vision as a preaching team for the first preaching series of this year was that we really wanted to start the year on a super positive note and we wanted to focus on you know, what are the things that really excite us as a team about Jesus and also individually about Jesus and those of you that were here on New Year's Eve will, will hopefully remember something of what I said that day and I was speaking about love, and you might remember that we were looking at some of the ancient Greek words uh, in in the original translation of the Bible, which we've translated into love in more recent times. And there were four words there, and I focused on one in particular, which was agape love, which describes the the perfect kind of love that God shows towards his people. An unconditional love, a love that doesn't waver, a love that is totally self-sacrificial. And we, we looked at a, a passage in the Apostle Paul's second letter to the, the church in Corinth, and the outcome of that was that, that actually if we can't ourselves demonstrate something of that love, then everything else we do as Christians is, is kind of meaningless. And what I want to do this morning to kind of explain what truly excites me about Jesus is, is take that back a step and actually look at you know, how much it, it truly astounds and excites me that, that Jesus first loved us in that way to enable us to pour out that kind of love on other people. Because the one thing that I think above all inspires me and excites me about Jesus, and it's a pretty long list, but the one thing at the very top is that he has the capacity to agape love, to, to totally selflessly, to totally unconditionally love the completely unlovable in us. And as you can imagine, love has been quite front and center in my mind in the past, the past week or two. Um, Mariam, against her better judgment last weekend, agreed to, uh, to spend the rest of her life with me, which it turns out is quite a big deal as I was preparing myself for that moment. Um, and obviously, I will be as close to the perfect husband as you can find, I'm sure. You know, I'm, I'm not a big arguer. I don't have particularly strong opinions on things. Um, you know... I'll just be quite chilled out, I suppose, and do what I'm told. I imagine is how it will go. But, um, but nonetheless, it was a pretty big deal for us to agree to spend the rest of our lives together, especially when, in all seriousness, I am far from perfect. And I think I know that better than anybody else. But, you know, in the last two years that we've been together, I've let Mariam down in that time. You know, I've said things that I shouldn't have said. I've disappointed her from time to time. In fact, I've done most of those things this morning. So, um, but in spite of that, she has chosen to spend the rest of her life with me and to love me unconditionally for the rest of our lives. And, you know, as angelic as she may seem, she has her moments as well, I can tell you. And I've made the decision to do the same thing. <laughs> And that in itself is quite amazing, isn't it? That even as humans, we can choose, despite the fact that we have the capacity to hurt each other and to disappoint each other and to let each other down, it's kind of amazing that we can choose unconditional love over and above that. That in itself is is amazing. But that being the case, how much more amazing is it that a perfect God chooses to do that for us when we are so far from perfect? Let me give you a bit of an analogy. And I'm going to go with the most likely scenario here. And I want you to imagine two friends discussing one of the friend's other half. And like I say, I'll go with the most likely scenario, which is two girls are chatting about one of their boyfriends who has let them down, who's made a mistake. And the friend is there for moral support, is there to give them guidance on this relationship issue that they're having. And I imagine one of three scenarios here. You know, let's say this is the boyfriend's first mistake. It's the first time he's messed up. You know, the friend is probably going to give advice along this kind of lines. You know, yes, he's a plonker. Yes, he's made a mistake. But, you know, he hasn't done this before. He really loves you. I'm sure you'll get over it. That's probably scenario number one. Scenario number two, let's say this is a repeat offense. Let's say he's done this before. Then scenario number two might go a little bit more like... You know, this isn't the first time this has happened. 
Are you sure, you know, he's the right guy for you? Are you sure that you're still happy in this relationship? And then maybe scenario number three, let's say the guy's a real dirtbag, you know, and this has happened many, many times, then the conversation might go a little bit more like, I'm starting to get a bit worried about you now. You know, this is happening a lot. Are you, you know, are you sure this is right? I feel like you can do better than this. And I've been in these conversations over the years. I've been the one that can't see the wood from the trees. And I've also been the one saying to my friend, I can't understand why you're still in this relationship. I can't understand why you're still here. And as I was preparing for this morning, I was thinking, what advice would I give Jesus on his relationship with me? What advice would I give Jesus on whether or not I was a waste of his time and a waste of his love? And I just want you to, to hold that thought for a little while and consider it for yourselves as we, as we look at a passage together in the Bible. And in the interest of taking a step back from what I preached on New Year's Eve, where we talked about something that the Apostle Paul had written in guidance to the early church, I want to kind of step back from that this morning and look at actually where the Apostle Paul was before he even came into a position where he could give guidance to the early church. And for those of you that weren't here on New Year's Eve, we talked about how Paul was you know, very much one of the founding fathers of the early Christian church that emerged after Jesus lived and died. Um, and Paul was a phenomenal church planter, missionary, preacher. Um, God used him to write the vast majority of the New Testament that we read today in our modern translation. But, but actually his earlier life was far from that impressive and that idyllic. And I just want us to read together from a, a passage in Acts 9 in the New Testament, and we're going to read from verses 1 to 19. And here Paul is still referenced by his old name, Saul. And it says this, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. <coughs> In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord, the Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come out, place his hands on him, and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placed his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up, he was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So Paul was a remarkable man on many levels, really. You know, as we've, as we've discussed, his ministry was, his ministry, and that's a churchy word for you know, his walk with Jesus, his works that he conducted during his life on behalf of Jesus, was amazing. And it was a ministry that many of us can only ever dream of, really. You know, he reached more people for Jesus than anybody else in history. His words probably led more people to Christianity than anyone else. And like I said before, probably the greatest evangelist and missionary this world has ever seen. But even more remarkable than that is that God even gives him the chance to become that man. I mean, that in itself is astonishing. Let's have a closer look at the start of that passage. 
It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found anybody there following Jesus, he could take them as prisoners. And the, prior to that, the last that we read about Saul is in the previous chapter in, in Acts 8, verses 3, where we're told Saul is destroying the church. That's the language that, that's used. He's destroying the church and he's going from house to house, dragging off men and women and throwing them in prison. So this man's biggest aim in life was to bring down the church and to persecute people that were following Jesus. And just for context here, this journey that he's making from Jerusalem to Damascus, this was an 130 mile journey. So that's at least a six day on foot kind of journey if you're, if you're at a good pace. So that's the kind of commitment that Saul had to bringing down you know, the kingdom of God. And with that in mind, the first half of this story actually makes a lot of sense to me. This first half of his encounter with Jesus, where you know, he struck down and blinded. That makes a lot of sense to me. If I was God, I'd stop the story there. You know, you've messed with me. I'm bigger than you. Now you can't see anything, and you're stuck in the middle of nowhere. So, good luck. That's where I would stop the story, but you know, it's a good job I'm not God. But Jesus, who, who the Bible teaches is not just God's son, but actually a very part of God himself, could have dealt with Saul that way. He could very feasibly have dealt with him that way. And I think sometimes in, in modern society, we like to build up that image of God. The image that you know, he enjoys giving us what we deserve. That he revels in his power. That he enjoys seeing our downfall when we're so helpless in comparison. But I think what we see from this passage here, from this encounter that Saul has with Jesus, is that that is not the way that he, he deals with man. And I'm blown away by the grace that he shows Saul. You know, he blinds him for a short while, but even in a way, that is an act of grace. Because I'm pretty sure once you've had an encounter that real and that meaningful with Jesus, you've lost your sight and it's been restored again. You know, you're gonna be pretty sure the, that he's the real deal at that point. And Jesus allows him to continue on to Damascus, and he comes into contact with Ananias, who, who like me, is going, Jesus, why would I do that? Like, why would I go and help him? Why would I go and help a man that is bringing your kingdom down, that is destroying your church, that is pretty much enemy number one to the Christian community in the region at this time? Let's just leave him like that. It's much better for us if he's like that, and if we go back to our, our girlfriend-boyfriend analogy from earlier on, you know, this Jesus-Saul relationship is pretty one-sided, isn't it? You know, Saul is out there persecuting the church, trying desperately to destroy every good thing that, that the people following Jesus are doing. And yet Jesus is loving him and showing grace and showing forgiveness. And it literally makes no sense to me. That, that algorithm makes no sense at all. And just like when I was having that conversation with my friend, even in this last year, about I cannot understand why you're still in this relationship. I cannot understand what's in this for you. It's that same kind of thing because the Bible teaches us that every one of our relationships with God is exactly like that. It's so outrageously one-sided. In Romans 5 verse 8 it says, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I actually really like the message version of that text, which says this, Christ arrives right on time to make this happen. He didn't and doesn't wait for us to get ready. He presented himself for this sacrificial death when we were far too weak and rebellious to do anything to get ourselves ready. And even if we hadn't been so weak, we wouldn't have known what to do anyway. And what this passage is saying is that there is nothing we can do to ready ourselves for the love of God. There's nothing we can do to earn it. There's nothing we can do to justify it. And even though he knows that we will fail him on a daily basis, our human minds, our human bodies are not capable of returning that love in the purest way, Jesus still loved us enough to put himself on a cross for us. And here's what really excites me about Jesus. He's love blind for us. And that's the phrase that I would use. And I've thought about this a lot. He's totally love blind for us. 
you know, again, we'll go back to that same analogy. And again, I'll use the most likely scenario. When you see a couple and you think, oh, that girlfriend's lovely and the boyfriend's a total buffoon. You know, we've all seen people like that, haven't we? People probably say it about me and Mariam. You know, and you just think sometimes, you think, I can understand why he's in this relationship, but what is in it for her? What does she get out of this? And you think she must be blind if she thinks this relationship is good for her. That guy doesn't know how lucky he is. We say stuff like that all the time, don't we? And, and actually, we don't know how lucky we are sometimes. And we are the luckiest people in the world to have that kind of love poured on us when we're just so incapable of giving it back or reciprocating it. I looked at the definition for love blind and I went to Urban Dictionary, which I think is the most reliable source on, on the internet. And, uh, and the definition in there was making decisions that are known to be costly in one way or another due to being in love. Making decisions that are known to be costly in one way or another due to being in love. And if we are love blind in a human relationship, then we might make decisions that cost us something. And maybe they'll cost us pain. Maybe they'll cost us inconvenience. Maybe they'll cost us finances because we can't get past this feeling that we have for somebody. And because of his love blindness for us, God actually gave the ultimate cost. He gave something worth so much that we can't even really fathom it. But in order to try and understand something of that cost, we firstly have to understand something of the gospel message, which again is a churchy phrase, but it means the message of actually who Jesus is and what he did for us. And if we go back to the very first book in the Bible in Genesis, we, we read a bit about the start of this journey. And we read about God creating the first man in Adam. And he created man and he created the perfect environment for man to have relationship with him and to have companionship with him. We read in Genesis that he was surrounded by trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. We're told there was a river that ran through the Garden of Eden and watered the garden. We're told that God created a helper, a companion for Adam in the form of Eve, so he wouldn't be lonely. The climate, the climate was perfect. They didn't need clothes. Shame wasn't even a thing at that point in time. And we're told that God looked at what he had created and he said, this is very good. And that's a pretty high standard, isn't it? You know, when I build something, I think it's very good. I mean, I was particularly proud of myself last year because I, I built a particularly tricky IKEA wardrobe by myself. And it said explicitly in the instructions that it needed two people to build it, but I did it all by myself. And then I looked upon my creation and I said, this is very good. <laughs> and in truth, it probably wasn't very good. It was acceptable, I would say. But here is God who created the heavens, who created the earth, whose creative genius put us together, we're told, in our mother's wombs. All of the complexities of the human DNA he stitched together. And that God looks on the environment that he's built for man to have companionship with him. And he says, this is very good. So Adam and Eve must, in that moment, not have wanted for anything. They must have been in such a perfect environment. But we're told that they, they decided to turn their back on God. Satan tempts them in the garden to disobey him, and they do it. And at that point, sin, which is, again, the churchy word for all the wrong things that happen in this world, everything that's outside of perfection, sin was able to enter the world for the first time. And again, if I, was, if I was God here at this point, when man have allowed imperfection to destroy the perfection that I'd created, I would probably have wiped them off and started again. I've given you everything here. I've given you every opportunity. I've given you perfect environment to be with me. And it wasn't enough. But again, God's love, God's agape love for Adam and Eve was too much to do that. So even though the world has changed at this point, even though sin has entered, even though imperfection has come, he still strives to have relationship with his people. But we're told that generation upon generation from this point onwards disobey God, go against him, look for their own solutions, build false gods to worship in place of him, all sorts of crazy things, looking for answers elsewhere, outside of him. And there's just no way to break this cycle. And at one point, God does something that he says he will never do again. And he actually floods the whole earth apart from all of the people that are following him and serving him. 
So almost he takes the best of the best and he puts them on a boat and he wipes everything else out. But even then, sin creeps back into the world and it just continues in this never-ending cycle. And there's no way to break it because man is incapable of reciprocating that love. Man is incapable of giving that back in that purest sense that we receive it without God interfering with our ability to make our own decisions and to have free will. And so at this point, he has a decision to make. And his decision is either, am I going to wipe out mankind forever? Am I going to just wipe them out? Or am I going to recreate them in some different way? Or am I going to send somebody to be that cost? Am I going to find a way to counterbalance that huge cost of sin that's now sitting in the world and separating them from me? And so in that moment of love blindness, Because of his overwhelming agape love for us as man, God sends his one and only son, Jesus, to take on that cost and to die on the cross for all of those wrong things so that our imperfection might be paid for eternally. So to summarize that, God gives man everything. Man turns his back on God. God tries again. Man continues to turn his back on God. And then because there's no other way, Jesus comes as the sacrifice and as the total cost for us. And then even today, even after that, my perfection is not fixed. I'm still broken. I still let God down daily, despite my best efforts. I'm still imperfect. I'm still unable totally to reciprocate that love. But now Jesus is bridging that gap for me. Now Jesus is acting as that conduit between me and God, even in my perfection, my imperfection. So what excites me about Jesus? The fact that I can never earn it and I can never deserve it, but I have access to his agape love excites me. The fact that he loves me so much that even though he'd already given so much, he was prepared to pay the ultimate cost in the gift of his son. It excites me that in some messed up way that I will never understand, he sees me as worthy of that cost. He sees me as a worthwhile cause for such an outrageous cost. And to me, that makes no sense. Because Jesus is love blind towards me. And without Jesus, this story is pretty depressing, actually. You know, without Jesus, we are just stuck in a cycle of sin that we can never break and we can never change and we can never free ourselves from. But not only does Jesus say today, you are precious and you are so valuable to me, But actually, in his death, we somehow, in some inexplicable way, become worthy of that relationship with God. And that really excites me. You know, despite what society tells us, there's nothing we can actually do on this planet to increase our value. No accomplishments, no careers, no success, no accolades, no praise. Nothing actually increases our value as a human being on this earth. But Jesus makes me valuable, somehow. And that blows my mind. And I started this morning by asking you a question, which was, if you were to give Jesus advice on whether you were a good investment of his time and of his love, what would you say? Because I know what I'd say. And in spite of myself, his love is ready and waiting for me. And his love is ready and waiting for anybody this morning that might want to receive it. And I want you to know this morning, if you know nothing else, that you are so incredibly valued by Jesus. And maybe that's all you need to know today. And maybe you come from a place where you don't feel hugely valued by other people, or by your family, or by your friends. And at the very least, I want you to go from this place today, never doubting again just how valuable you are, and how worthy of the cost Jesus saw you. And if you're hearing that for the first time today, then I'd love to chat with you afterwards a little bit more or maybe chat to the person that brought you along or someone that you trust here, Marcus. You know, just chat to somebody afterwards if you want to just talk that through a little bit more. But even if you've been a Christian for many years, it's important for us to remind ourselves of this regularly and to never lose the excitement of that huge cost that God has put on us, that huge value that he's put on us. And I'll finish with one final thought. 
you know, like I said at the start, it, it kind of blows my mind that Mariam thinks I'm worth spending the rest of her life with and unconditionally loving for the rest of our lives. But I am capable of giving some things back to Mariam. I can begin to kind of reciprocate that love. I catch spiders, for one. I do that pretty regularly. I built her bed last year so that she has somewhere to sleep. You know, that's giving something back, surely. I wash her car from time to time. You know, so even if at a very base level, I am just a spider catching, bed building, car washing moron, then at least I can still begin to do something to reciprocate the love that she gives to me. But I am totally, totally incapable of even beginning to reciprocate the love that God pours out on me. And that blows my mind, because nothing in this world comes free. And yet the love of God, the most precious thing we could ever have, is a gift freely available to you and to me today. And if that doesn't excite you, then you need to check your pulse.